All right, guys. Hey, and today we're going to talk about gases and gas laws. We are going to get into some information that's both practical and informative as it pertains to gas laws from a content and conceptual understanding, and we'll couple that with some mathematical application. We won't dive as deep into solving problems, but you will see some example problem sets as well. And so uh, let's just keep in mind that as we're going through this, the key to understanding gases is that they all tend to behave in the same way, physically at least, if not chemically. So for example, we know the gases tend to expand to fill the entire container or any container that they're in. Um, also, they have this uncanny ability to be compressed to fill smaller volumes. Now, when we go through this PowerPoint slide and these presentations, I want you to go in hopefully with a body of knowledge and familiarity of some algebraic concepts that are applied with the ideal gas laws. And Hopefully, you'll be able to master manipulating when to use these gas laws to answer certain questions about the gases themselves. We'll talk about some exceptions of real gases, and we'll talk about a number of other things. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now, the basics on gases. This is a kind of a conceptual term or understanding, and that's that the atmosphere that we know of is comprised of gases, with about 78% of it being nitrogen and 21% of it being oxygen. Now, as I kind of mentioned earlier, gases have the ability to expand to fill the container that they're placed into. They're also compressible, and they can be used to form homogeneous mixtures, which means they're pretty much almost uniform looking, and if you can see them, that is. Uh, and this uh, is due to gas particles being very far apart and always in constant random motion. And we'll kind of talk about this more when we start talking about the kinetic theory of gases themselves. Um, but going forward, uh, vapors, which is a popular term that's used, uh, refers to gases of substances that are normally liquids or solids, i.e. gasoline vapors, you know, anything of that nature. So before we really get into it, we want to talk about pressure because one of the kind of paramount initial introduction pieces to gases is understanding pressure and the various pressure conversions. Now from a conceptual standpoint, uh, pressure just means the force per net area and force can be represented in newtons um, and then area can be represented in your meters squared. And so when you solve for pressure, you end up with a value of it being newtons uh, per meter squared. And those units that are associated with that can be expressed in a number of ways. Now, as a refresher, when we talked about pressure conversions, there are a number of units that should come to mind, notably millimeters of mercury, torr, kilopascals, or even bar, uh, just to name a few. And all of these that are listed convert to equal the most prominent conversion, which is pressure eight, 1 ATM, which 1 ATM is basically the staple for standard pressure um, conditions. Um, now, 1 bar is equal to 10 to the 5 pascals. And just to kind of give you context, if we're talking about this idea of pressure, at a depth of 350 meters, the hull pressure on a submarine is 3.4 times 10 to the 6 pascals, which is roughly 36 tons per squared feet. So that's a large amount of pressure that is applied. Now, a barometer is generally used to measure pressure, but the way it works is um, worth noting. Uh, what happens is you set up kind of a open system where you have mercury and on top of that mercury it features kind of a vacuum system of air and then what happens is the outside atmosphere which would be our combination of nitrogen and oxygen actually presses down on the mercury which at room temperature can be liquid and depending on how much pressure is being exerted in our atmosphere will cause this vacuum area to be de decompressed. 
Now, as a measurement, you can actually quantify this change from what it would be st in standard conditions to whatever the current conditions are of the atmosphere to find out what the barometric pressure is. And so if you've ever like looked at your nearest weather channel, they always talk about the barometric pressure in terms of millimeters of mercury. Now, for all intended purposes, this would be more of what the old age mercury system looks like, but it's a platform that is still used today for pressure measurements. Now, um, this interesting little instrument is called an aneroid barometer. And when I see the word aneroid, I'd hope you think about the um, concept of anaerobic. Um, and so this type of pressure system is pressure sensitive and it is sealed and it is used to measure air pressure and it operates using kind of a uh, a box with flexes which moves the spring and the dial. Now another system of pressure reading uh, comes from that of a manometer. Now a manometer has a combined amount of gas and then depending on how much air pressure is exerted, exerted on it, it will cause the actual confined solution to move up and down. Now this movement can be quantified. So if it starts off here, and let's say there's air pressure pressing down to that part, it can actually um, confine the gas and give you kind of a pressure reading. Um, and so yeah, if there's small pressure, and the height is higher or raised, then, um, then you're going to have a lot of pressure. Now here you have a sealed system. And basically the pressure of the gas is basically equal to the height of the manometer in question. And manometers can be used to kind of measure the amount of pressure force from a gas. So that's kind of why that's useful. All right, so one of the gas laws I want to start off with is that of Boyle's Law. And so Boyle's Law operates under the principle of a uh, relationship between pressure and volume, where when you have a, a beginning system and it has a specific pressure, which usually is measured in ATM and has volume, which is usually measured in liters, um, something is done to the system to change that pressure or volume. and you can actually quantify those values through calculations. Um, keeping in mind, Boyle's law operates under the premise that temperature is held constant. And it actually maintains an inverse relationship where um, as your pressure increases from one system, um, that's going to cause the volume to decrease over time. And that's what that graphical representation um, kind of shows. So that's your inverse relationship there shared between pressure and volume. With Charles's law, the relationship is centered upon volume and temperature. And in this case, your pressure is held constant. And what happens here is your volume is measured in liters. Your temperature is generally measured in Kelvin. And depending on if the pr uh, volume or temperature are impacted, you end up having kind of a direct relationship where as volume increases, so does temperature. And so they are in direct relationship. Now, as a kind of caveat is that you need to know that temperature must always be measured in Kelvin. Next we have Gay-Lussac's law, and this one is a measurement between pressure and temperature, where pressure is 1 atm, temperature is in Kelvin, and in this particular circumstance, volume is held constant. And when solving questions such as these, um, the relationship here, again, is direct, meaning as the pressure increases, so does the temperature. When the pressure decreases, temperature decreases. So they have that direct relationship. Now with Avogadro's number, it's kind of a little bit different here because it causes you to recall your understanding of Avogadro. Um, 
basically equal volumes of gas at the same temperature and pressure have the same number of particles. And this kind of comes from Amadeo Avogadro. That's where this stems from. So, for example, 22.4 liters of any gas at standard temperature and pressure automatically contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Now, and an extract relationship you should get from this is you should understand that um, you could say that 22.4 liters of any gas at STP also contains one mole. So that's the relationship shared there as well. Now, Avogadro's law states that volume of a gas is proportional to the number of moles of a gas. So there's that relationship that is extracted from those uh, two when dealing with Avogadro's law. And Avogadro, interestingly enough, has a history where, you know, there's a relationship where you talk about guacamole and avocado's number or Avogadro's number. So there you are, avocado in the flesh. All right, so the combined gas law represents an extension of the three laws that we mentioned of Boyle, Charles, and Gay-Lussac's law. Um, where they combine the parameters of pressure, volume, and temperature. And so for all gas law calculations, you want to use the absolute temperature in Kelvin. And like I said, it merges all three of the laws where um, you want to maintain consistency in those measurements and those calculations. Now, the ideal gas law is kind of derived from this idea that gases behave in a certain fashion. Here, pressure represents the force per area, and that's usually in ATMs. Your volume is usually represented in liters. The N is represented by moles, and then R actually represents a rate constant. Um, and depending on the units implied or incorporated, will require you to use 8.314 when you have liters and kilopascals, or I much prefer 0.08206 when you have liters, ATMs, moles, and Kelvin. Um, so another staple that needs to be recalled is the understanding that standard temperature pressure which is STP, stands for um, 0 degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin and 1 atm of pressure. Now adding to this is equations for gas density. And it combines the premises of density with that of gas laws. And it states that density is essentially equal to pressure and mass over the rate constant and T, which is temperature. And in this case, what we're talking about for mass is actually molar mass of the gas. And if you want to extend that to the combined gas law, you pretty much have the same set of conditions. However, you end up replacing uh, volume with density and redirecting the equation. So as I said, we're going to take a look at solving problems involving volumes of gases, not at standard temperature and pressure conditions. And to that, to solve those problems, you will require the use of PV and RT and the advent of stoichiometry. So it should, should make for an interesting time um, solving problems. The first one I want to look at is where we uh, basically we want to find the volume of hydrogen needed to react with carbon at 981 torr, 334 degrees Celsius, to yield 42 grams in pentane. Now, before you uh, do any calculations, you first need to write out your equation um, and understand that hydrogen plus carbon is going to yield your pentane uh, material. Now, is the reaction balanced? Not yet, but it can be easily. Um, once it's balanced, you then can kind of proceed into the next course of things. I would start personally with just converting the 42 grams of impentane to moles. Um, you do so by taking the molar mass of the impentane 
and you're going to divide that by 72 grams of inventane, and you're going to multiply that molar mass of imp I mean, not the molar mass, you'll multiply that answer by the mole ratio, represented by six moles of hydrogen, one mole of inventane, and you end up with your answer of 3.5 moles hydrogen. Now, you're only part of the way through because you still have to find the volume of hydrogen. But now that you've extracted this moles of hydrogen, you can apply the ideal gas law equation to solve the problem further. And this can be achieved by just converting the necessary items. 981 TOR is going to have to be converted to ATMs. That can be done by dividing by 760. You'll need to convert your 334 degrees Celsius to... Kelvin by adding 273.15, and now that you've converted your moles, the only thing you're left solving for is V. You'd have to rearrange it to put the P in the denominator, and when it's set up, the equation is going to look something like this. And when you solve, what you should get for an answer should be 135 liters of hydrogen. Now, for our Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure, we need to understand that gases mix. They have an inherent nature of being able to mix. Uh, they do so better than liquids and definitely a lot better than solids. And so we want to kind of look at the relationship shared by those partial gases as they contribute to partial pressure. Now, the actual equation itself states that all of the pressures the total pressure represents a combination of the individual partial pressures. And basically, it's the pressure that each gas would exert if it was by itself. And so other equations that can be extracted from this are, the, when talking about gases, would be that of the total mole relationship, where total mole gas mixture is representative of a combination of each individual mole that has contributed to it. And so the mole fraction of a gas mixture, which can be calculated or acquired from this, is represented by a ratio of the moles of the individual gas with respect to the moles of the total amount of all gases contributing. And so let's look at a question where we kind of use these principles. Here we're tasked with finding the total pressure exerted by 38 grams of carbon monoxide and 38 grams of hydrogen in a 6-liter container at 25 degrees Celsius. And before you begin this, what you need is you need to go ahead and convert your grams of each gas into moles. And so you do so by dividing um, each one by their molar mass. And you're going to then require the, the ideal gas law equation. So as I stated, you first need to find the total moles um, of both gases. And then you're going to apply the ideal gas law to solve this question. Um, to do so, you start by finding the moles of each individual gas, 38 grams divided by the molar mass of carbon dioxide, which is 28 grams. Um, and then you end up with the moles of carbon monoxide. Next, you do the same process using the hydrogen gas, where you divide that by its molar mass. And once you solve that, you have the mole, uh, moles of hydrogen. And you're going to add them together to get your end mole total, which is kind of step one up here. So you end up with a grand total of 20.357 moles. And now you can apply the uh, ideal gas law equation. Um, we'll deviate a little bit in the R value that we're going to use. We're going to use the 8.314, uh, but you solve it by just using 20.357 times 8.314 times the 298.15, which is the temperature that's been converted to Kelvin, and then this 6 comes from the 6 liters of the vessel used. And so once solved, you get a value of 8,410 for the total pressure, but um, let's say we were interested in finding, I don't know, the contributing pressure of each gas. So 
the ratio of the partial pressure is the same as the mole ratio. And to solve this, all we're going to need to do is know the total pressure and have our mole fraction of each gas. If you recall, um, part over whole of the mole fraction, we can multiply that by the total pressure, and that'll give us the pressure exerted by carbon monoxide gas, and we can apply the same principle with hydrogen, where you take the partial over the total, multiply that by the pressure exerted by the gas as a whole, and that gives you the pressure exerted by that gas. And so each one has an individual pressure when you have 38 grams of carbon dioxide and 38 grams of hydrogen gas. Now let's look at the kinetic molecular theory, um, which is important because it deals with Basically, the motion of gases, if you will, think about the idea of kinetic energy. Kinetic energy usually refers to energy in motion. That's probably one of those precepts that you kind of already have been doctrine. Now, the underlying idea behind kinetic theory is the concept of the kinetic energy. Uh, and basically, the particles of matter within a gas undergo vigorous motions as a result of this kinetic energy within them. Now, gas particles have a lot of kinetic energy and constantly move about colliding with one another or with other objects. This is a complicated picture, but scientists simplify things by imagining um, ideal gas, if gases were able to um, constantly be in motion. So, you know, you want the particles to move randomly. Uh, the volume of the particles is negligible compared to the container volume. So that means whatever vessel size is in there, it's believed that an ideal gas is not impacted by the size of the container that's being used to contain it. Um, gas particles neither attract nor repel one another, and the forces between them are negligible. Um, and then that they are elastic. Basically, when particles collide, the collisions are elastic. They're perfectly bouncy with no loss of net energy. So, and then number five, that the average kinetic energy of particles is proportional to their temperature. So, temperature impacts their kinetic energy in a proportional relationship. Now, the ideal of, the model of the ideal gas explains why gas pressure increases with increased temperature. By heating a gas, you add kinetic energy to those particles. So, at a given temperature, the gas particles of sample A would have the same average kinetic energy of the gas particles of sample B. Now, the pressure is going to refer to how hard and how often gas particles are colliding with the sides of a container. A lot of times when I try to represent understanding gas and gas movement, uh, especially if you think about something like a balloon, think about gas molecules all trying to exert and push out and press out in all various directions. You end up with kind of a, a circular direction of uh, gas particles moving, um, if you will. And so they're always in motion, always in movement. Now, how hard or how often is what's going to dictate that pressure. And the more, the more um, often they're pressing against the walls of a container, the higher the pressure. And how hard, meaning how much uh, force is being exerted, is going to also dictate that. So kind of putting in perspective, we're going to talk about how um, these conditions of gas pressure can be impacted by um, their external conditions or the containers, etc. So when you have one mole of neon gas at 25 degrees Celsius in a 5 liter container, it's going to have a certain trajectory of how the gas moves. Now if you increase that temperature to 350 degrees, what should happen is those gas particles should move faster which should also cause an increase in 
the amount of pressure and also their kinetic energy. Likewise, if you compare um, the neon gas at one mole and you compare that to that of five moles, you'll see that at a standard one mole condition, you know, it has a certain pressure that's synonymous with the first example. But when you increase the number of neon gas, what you get is the more often part of that description of pressure. So in the first example, it's how hard, and this is probably going to, this bottom one's going to allude to how often. Now, just as a statement of understanding, the particle velocity distribution of gases refers to the fact that gas particles tend to move faster when they are smaller. And so when you're talking about this, um, over time an increase of those number of particles does kind of have an impact on how fast, but there's a certain threshold for um, size where the most massive gases are going to tend to move slower. The intermediate sizes are going to move moderately paced, and then the smaller gases are going to move at the fastest rate. And this is independent of temperature and pressure. This is just the gases, if they were at the same temperature, same pressure, smaller ones going to move faster. In a similar scenario, you have various temperature conditions, and you're comparing them based on the premise that they have the same gas and the same pressure. Now, at various temperatures, that's going to mean that at colder temperatures, the gases tend to move slower. At warmer temperatures, the gases are going to move faster. And, you know, that's adding energy when you're thinking about it from a temperature perspective. Now, what should come to mind from all this is the idea of the speed of gases and how they travel. Now, in this particular equation, it's representing how gases' temperature and their size can actually impact their rate of speed. Now, to calculate an average kinetic energy, you need this expression for average velocity. In this expression, U represents the average velocity of a collection of particles. And so R is your ideal gas constant, and M is your molar mass in kilograms. So kind of take a minute to kind of look at this equation. Now, this relates the kinetic energy average of a particle, and essentially it means that there's an equation where half the mass of the velocity is how you determine the kinetic energy of that gas. And so when I talk about this relationship, I usually draw on the idea that mass is going to have a direct impact, or molar mass rather, is going to have a direct impact on the speed of that particle. And so if you were trying to find the RMS for chlorine gas at 80 degrees Celsius, you would assume that T is 80 degrees Celsius, and you would convert that to 353 Kelvin. You would then incorporate the molar mass of the chlorine, which is roughly 71 grams, because remember chlorine is Cl2. And then... Once you convert that to kilograms, you can plug it into the equation where 3 times the rate constant times the temperature is 353 over the molar mass in kilograms. You take the square root of that. Solving, you get the value of 352 meters per second. And so the big setting point is that uh, the more massive the movement, the slower it tends to go, and the less massive the movement, the faster it tends to travel between the two of them. 
Uh, so for gases, rates of diffusion and diffusion, obey Graham's law. And for Graham's law, that's kind of that idea where the size of the gas particle plays a role in the behavior or speed or movement of the particle itself. So, so if you ever heard the expression, wake up and smell a coffee, the command is usually used in kind of a scornful tone. But most people who have awakened to the smell of coffee kind of remember it fondly. Um, so when we're talking about these uh, movements of gases, we are talking about how certain processes like that can happen, such as diffusion or effusion. And so different gases diffuse at these different rates. Uh, and this depends solely on their molar mass. And so let's look at that equation or under Graham's law where you have the molar mass as a kind of a rate comparison. So to use it, you're assuming that each gas is operating at the same temperature. Because remember, temperature does impact kinetic energy and motion of gases. So if we're assuming that each gas is operating under constant temperature, then the molar mass is really what's going to dictate the rate of diffusion. And so the rate of diffusion of gases is slower than the molecular speeds um, because of collisions. So on average, they collide, uh, collide about 10 times 10 to the 9 times per particle. So the mean free path is going to be the average distance traveled by a particle between their collisions. It tends to be shorter when the pressure is going to be higher. All right, so methane moves 1.58 times faster than which noble gas? So if you're given a question like this, you already know the gas methane, CH4, and you kind of know that it's 1.58. So you're kind of using that rate equation to kind of work backwards. And so I would think about it in terms of size. The molar mass of methane is roughly 16 grams per mole. And so you know one of your values is that. And you know you don't know the other value. So in this case, you're assuming that your M2 is probably going to be your a molar mass of methane and then your molar 2 could be the second one. So that cancels out helium. And so to solve this, you kind of could, um, yeah, incorporate the ratio of the 1.58. You're going to square both sides. Then the 16 becomes um, a, an actual number, and the 1.58 gets squared. And then you multiply those together, and you end up with a value of 39.9 grams per mole. That being the case, the one closest to that is going to be argon. Because it's not going to be neon. All right, so we've talked about ideal gases and the ideal expectation, but in truth, ideal gases are more like idealations. They're, they're idealized notions of what we would expect gases to behave like. Real gases, however, do not obey these ideal gas laws. At certain temperatures and pressures, they actually provide good approximations but there are definitely situations when a more sophisticated and therefore a more complicated equation may be needed than the ideal gas laws. Now, all real gases 
deviate to some degree from this PVNRT. As I mentioned, the most pronounced effect happens when there's either high pressure and or when there's low temperature. And so because this is unlikely in those kind of conditions, you need another kind of set of temperatures. So when we assume that uh, gas is ideal, it means that assuming that its particles are occupying no space and do not attract one another. But really, real gases defy both of these postulates. They do occupy space, and they do attract one another. At pressures that are high, this fact becomes increasingly difficult to ignore because the space between the gas particles themselves becomes smaller and smaller, and the assumption is only valid when the space when the gas molecules, well, the space within the gas molecules is greater than the size of the individual molecule. So, using this, we need to understand that they do occupy space and they do experience attractive forces. Now, the ideal gas law equation is represented as PV equals NRT, or if you want to solve it for pressure, it's P equals NRT. But when we account for real gases, we got to account for the Van der Waals equation. And basically, this introduces a set of constants. And another thing that should make clear is that you can understand why chemists probably prefer the ideal gas law equation, because this equation here looks a little bit more complicated than the standard equation. But we'll try to break it down. In this equation, two new constants, called the Van der Waals constants, appear in the equation. The constant A is measurement of how strongly the gas molecules attract one another, and has a unit of liter squared ATMs mole squared. Now, the constant B represented right here, is a measurement of the volume occupied by a mole of gas molecules and has a unit of liters times moles. These constants vary as the identity of the gas in question varies. So this was originally kind of created by uh, Mr. Van der Waals. And this correction accounts for that particle volume. And it asks for a correction for the particle attraction, which are the two postulates that are broken when you're talking about real gases. So this attraction actually makes the P smaller than ideal gas star predicts. And the correction for particle volume Particles with some volume tend to exert a bigger pressure than those with zero volume. So, let's look at the effect of particle volume. Ideal gas particles. Mass represented by M, speed represented by V, and no volume. Now, let's look at real gas particles. Mass represented by M, speed represented by V, and yes, they do have a volume. Now, in this case, there's a shorter mean free path which means that there are going to actually be more collisions per second when you're talking about a real gas particle. And so this ultimately leads to there being a larger pressure than the ideal gas law equation predicts. So revisiting it, the constants of A and B are unique for each gas, like I said. A is large when interparticle attractions are large, and B is large for large gas particles. So size as well as attraction plays a role. A and B both tend to increase as the mass of the gas increase, and both are larger for xenon 
than neon. And so that completes our gas laws presentation. We've covered green.